growing as you. Good luck. All right, we're recording. Okay. Well, hello everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Racken, and welcome back to version 0002 of the Digital Rebar Online Meetup. How is everybody doing today? Doing good. Excellent. Doing all right. Good and excellent. Fabulous. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, version 3.2. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here for our uh, agenda, which has been posted on the Meetup page as well. So today we're going to talk about, uh, actually, we're going to talk about Kubernetes deployment demo. That's going to be very exciting. Uh, Rob is going to show us how to deploy Kubernetes with the Digital Rebar Provision uh, Ansible KubeSpray plugin. Uh, Victor from Racken is also going to show us passwords and keys, a quick five-minute demo on how to change your passwords and your keys. And then I will cover a little bit about loading content and what content is in Digital Rebar Provision, since we've had a lot of questions about what are the steps to get to a minimally usable uh, DRP endpoint. We'll wrap up with a little bit of DRP 3.2 planning and status and go over the enhancements requests and decide what ones we want to push into the to-do queue. And it'll be a first, uh, dry, uh, first run of our uh, uh, use of the GitHub issues and uh, projects uh, solution. So it'll probably be a little rough there. We'll get the kinks worked out on that. Last and not least, we'll open up the floor for any questions and answers. If anything they'd like to talk about. Um, for those of you who are new, uh, welcome. Uh, we have a lot of new faces on the, the meetup today. It's very exciting to see the community growing. Uh, we also have um, a lot of uh, information that is available for those of you seeking additional help or information regarding digital rebar provision. It's uh, in the agenda doc. There's a number of links on getting in touch with the digital rebar community. Uh, from the uh, Digital Rebar uh, website itself, rebar.digital, uh, the RackN website. Uh, those of you who haven't plugged into our Slack uh, community channel, we encourage you to plug in. Uh, you can sign up through the rackn.com support uh, Slack channel. And uh, you can also come in through the IRC or Gitter or uh, Gateways. And uh, we also have a lot of content on YouTube for those of you who like to ingest things in video form. So please check out the YouTube channel for Digital Rebar Provision if you have any questions uh, or are interested in some of the content, including our, all of our online meetups will be posted there as well. We have our first um, meetup posted there for those of you who want to review our first meetup. Uh, with that being said, Rob. Okay. Oh, Rob. We're, we're working to get uh, my configuration going from the SSH perspective. So, okay. We'll take a, give me a moment. Okay. Victor, are you ready to oh, present? Okay. So we, if we do Victor first, so give me a chance to get going. Victor, are you ready? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, it's a processing job. Okay. I can I can talk I can talk through it and while we while we look at getting things going. Um, so the, the the Kubernetes the Kubernetes work that we're doing um, is based on an Ansible set of playbooks called KubeSpray. So um, Rob, we've got no video from you. There we go. Um, there, no, it's, it's something else. Um, but it's based on an Ansible set of playbooks called KubeSpray, uh, also known as Cargo, and then previously known as KubeSpray. Um, and despite its, its name, it's actually a very popular community set of Ansible playbooks for installing Kubernetes. It's been going since version uh, 1.1, I think, officially, and um, has been evolving over time. We've been using it since those early days uh, in one form or another. And our position on installing Kubernetes is that we only do it using the, the community techniques. So we, we're really um, not, we don't want to, and, we're, and we, don't want, uh, we don't want to, and I don't want to promote using sort of forked one-off Kubernetes installers. We're really trying to keep 
that part in the community. Um, and so you, you, what our goal is here is to use Kubernetes straight up, um, and, or sorry, Coop spray straight up without modifications. Ow, packets um, not letting us log in. Let's see what happens. Well, Packet was undergoing some maintenance yeah, on its well, back end storage. What I'm going to do is I'm going to the process and we have a video that, that will complete it. Um, so let me, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, I think, do I have to get permissions to share? No, I don't. Okay. All right, Rob, so I see your screen. Right here is the, the, the rack and UX on front of in front of Digital Rebar, and I've provisioned a set of machines um, uh, for this demo. We'll see if we can we can get them working and, and figure out what's going on. Um, and if, and our goal here is not to train you on how to use the the rack and demo, uh, the rack and UX, or even install Digital Rebar. We're assuming you've already gotten to that point. You know how to get it. Get machines provisioned. You know how to get your SSH keys on them, um, and I know Victor is going to show show some of how that would work. Um, what what we're doing specifically here is we're using um, the Ansible, the baked in Ansible playbook functionality, um, and the, we use Coop Spray as an example of that. So, if you if you have uh, Digital Reaper already installed, what you want to make sure you've added is the Coop Spray uh, content. And we'll talk about what content is also. But this is going to bring in some seed uh, configuration information, some profiles that you can use to replicate this environment in for Kubernetes uh, with Coop Spray or any Ansible playbooks. Uh, and the way that works is that it builds a series of profiles uh, that are used uh, for this by, by the Ansible integration with Digital Rebar. Um, and so from that, from that, we have this one profile. Profile's um, sort of a, a variable holder, parameter holder. Uh, and you'll notice in this case deploy profile, we have definitions of which Ansible groups. We're going to use this maps directly. Let me bring up Coops for a So Kubernetes incubator, Coops spray. I've checked this out. I'll jump over to command line in a minute. Um, I'm just using this Kubernetes um, playbook. I cloned it on my local system, and it has a cluster file. Um, and I'll just, I'm literally just going to use the exact definition from here. Um, what I'm showing is documented in the digital rebar provision GitHub documentation integrations Ansible. So I'm, I'm just following the instructions uh, right here. Right, same thing. These are the groups that I'm about to show you in the UX. Um, so this tells me what, what groups I'm creating for Ansible. This is what Coop Spray expects. Um, this maps different uh, group variables from Ansible into Digital Rebar. So to keep things consistent, we didn't just call the profile etcd. We called it etcd Coop etcd so that things don't overlap. Everything else is pretty straightforward. We added some host variables, which is tells Ansible um, additional information that you need to run machines, in this case, the, the Ansible user's root. And um, then we also have a way to, to deal with parent group concepts, um, which is not, uh, Digital Rebar has no concept of nested profiles. So this allows us to pass that information into Ansible. If you're used to looking at an Ansible inventory file, basically this is, this is the key information you need plus the hosts to generate it. Um, if you're used to digital rebar, you'll notice this is read-only and I can't modify this. So what I want to do is I want to build a cluster. I want to clone this. So I'm going to take this deployment. I'm going to clone it. And this allows me, I'll call it demo. Um, this allows me to then operate on that profile in an in a effective way. So I could change the groups. So if I had my own playbook, uh, I could change the groups I want to use. I could change the mappings. I could add in additional variables. I could uh, create different parent groups. Um, I don't want to make any changes for this. We're just doing Kubernetes. This is designed for, for that exact behavior. 
And then from there, now that I've created that, you'll notice the demo profile in here, we've inherited the Kubernetes um, icon, but it shows that it's unlocked and writable. If I go into the Ansible button in the profiles view, I can now select that profile. You can see I've already done one called full system. I can come into the demo profile, and now it's taking those groups, the mapping ones with uh, digital rebar and the machines that I have, and then it's gonna generate, I can pick and choose what, how I want the system configured. So if I want Kube 1 to be etcd and my master, which I need for this, and then I wanted say two and three to be my worker nodes, um, I've, based, I've made those selections and I'll show you how this is gonna turn out. If I wanted to look and see the system I was using for testing, then in this system I made different choices. Um, Normally this would be that, right? I'd, I'd, I'd be using the machine, so I'm like, wow, you know what? This isn't a good idea. Let's no longer put one, two, and three into those into this uh, system. So now I've got one profile that has four and five. I've got a different profile that has one, two, and three. Uh, so that's, this is all I need to do for digital rebar. That's now set up. I'm going to switch over to command line because that's where we want to show uh, show the next stage of thing. People with me so far? Shane, thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my desktop. I'm going to switch to sharing command line. Everything else we're doing is command line because now we're talking about Ansel. Um, and this is where I've, I've checked out the Kubernetes uh, KubeSpray deployment. The other thing I've done is I have copied over our in the inventory file. So in digital rebar in the open source pieces, there is a Python inventory file that is used to generate Ansible dynamic inventory files. Um, and I can what what I can do with that is if I just try and run it, um, it's gonna it's it's gonna point to my local system by default. So before I start anything else. I need to know where I'm going to be uh, sending the system. So I'm, I'm picking up on a different screen. I'm going to pick up the endpoint IP address. So I need to set the endpoint that I'm going to be using. Whoops, and I have to type in the right. Uh, so this is my endpoint IP address. And then I also need to come in and I need to tell it um, which profile I want to use. So I'm going to tell it I want to use the demo profile. And so once I've set the profile, um, I can also set my credentials. I'm just using default for this. Um, then I can actually go and run this inventory file. I'm going to pretty it up by using JQ. But that, that Python file generates what Ansible expects to have in the correct format for an inventory file. It's actually optimized a little bit more because uh, Ansible in building a cluster will actually call this file repeatedly on a per host basis. And so that's, that's also baked in as part of the inventory optimizations. And what you'll see is that it actually tells us this is our kube master with this hosts. We could set variables in the profiles and they get passed in. This is my children that it expects to see. The meta field contains all of the host bars for each host, and we include some extra information um, so that you can go resolve bugs or, or things like that. So you can look at rebar's UUID, packets UUID. Um, and so basically what's gonna happen is the user and the host is enough for us to resolve the system. So this is our, in, our full inventory. And then we know which hosts are FCD, which hosts are kube. Um, if I wanted to, I could also do it like this. I could say RS profile equals uh, full system. And that would inject the profile information for full system, which you'll notice is giving me four and five as my, system, as my nodes. Um, and then, so at this point, we're done uh, from a digital rebar perspective. It, it has done, you know, we're generating an inventory We've used digital rebar to do the SSH keys, so all those pieces and parts are there. Um, what, what I can do is if I go, I'm going on a different screen, I'm going back to that, docu that document. Oh. 
and I can uh, do a test um, for my for my uh, cluster. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm cutting and pasting, save a little bit of time. But I'm just doing an Ansible ping. I'm using the inventory file, and it's going to go just test whether or not I have SSH connectivity working on the system, which I do. And um, from that perspective, it, it now is using that dynamic inventory. If I come back and say RS profile, RS profile, do I can type equals uh, full system, then I'll, I'll be pinning the other, the other machines in that, and I'll get uh, three, four, and five. I'm, I'm making a point of showing you how you can switch profiles, because this is a really important feature. We have a big system. You might have a lot of nodes you're testing against. You can easily pull out different nodes and run multiple deployments simultaneously against a single digital rebar. Um, if you saw a previous Ansible demo we did, we didn't have that feature. We added that in the last couple of weeks um, and actually really enhanced our whole Ansible integration. So this is pretty cool, but what I really want to be able to do is I want to install Kubernetes. That was what was built. Um, and so for that, uh, you will see that the amount of additional work I have to do is pretty small at this point because it's, we're just using KubeSpray. So for that, I want to run the Ansible playbook. I want to specify my inventory file, and I want to tell it to build the cluster. And so now it's going to go pull that inventory file and then start executing Ansible. Um, and that's it. At the, you know, we're going to pop out at the end of the meeting. Um, it takes a while to get this fully done, so you can check in with me at the end of the meeting, Shane. Uh, for it, it's just going to install node one. Uh, completely generic Kubernetes cluster. If I want to customize it, it's not a digital rebar thing, it's a kube spray thing. You can inject and override variables, um, so it would be possible to change the version or actually any setting you want. You can just set parameters in the profiles for digital rebar and they'll pass into the inventory file. Um, but at this point, you know, we're expecting you to know how to use Ansible. Um, for this process and modifying it six ways to Sunday are things that you can do pretty easily after this explanation. So, and of course, we're online and we're happy to help out. All right. Awesome. Sorry, it took a little bit more time than I think we were expecting, but. No, we slated 15 minutes for you, so we're, we're good. Uh, excellent. Uh, Victor. Hello, Victor. Up next, if we can. Uh, oh, uh, Shane, you're muted. Uh, can you hear me now? I'm still not hearing you. Oh, Eric said yes. I can hear you. <laughs> it's just you, Rob. Is it maybe it's us. What about you, Will? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can, can, can you hear you? All right, all right. It's just you, Rob. You just didn't want to hear me. So, Vic, up next. Right. Uh, well, if you heard us, then I'll, everything's good. This, I'll figure <laughs> out sound on our end. All right. So, uh, that was the demonstration uh, from Rob at RackEnd on how to deploy uh, Kubernetes through the Kube Spray. And next up, we're going to have Victor give us a very short, uh, brief demo on how to do. Uh, inject passwords and SSH keys into content. So a lot of the questions we've often gotten uh, on community uh, Slack channel is how do I make a tweak so I can, you know, gain access to the stuff I'm deploying? Sort of important. So Victor, if you are ready there, we're going to pass over control and screen share to you so you can start your demo. Okay. All right. No, no. Okay. Let's see. Share screen. And I think we will just do this one. All right. So hopefully, y'all can see my screen now. Yep. Awesome. So, first thing you need to do in order to, uh, why can't I click here? Probably because of the uh, 
it's that stupid little bar that it's drawing at the, right above my taskbar in Chrome. Okay, so first thing we need to do in order to be able to share the screen, or not to share the screen, but in order to uh, be able to set the SSH keys and the default password is we need to edit the global profile. And I've already done this so you can see what it looks like, but I'll jump back into the editing screen. Um, we have a parameter called access keys, and that contains a uh, map of who the key is for and what the key is. And this is my uh, SSH public key here. And then in order to set the uh, root password for an installed system, uh, we have to add another parameter called provisionary default password hash. And that winds up being a string that we generate with the uh, command uh, mk password. So Victor, these are all parameters you've added to the global profile, correct? Yes, because I'm lazy. <laughs> okay. So how would you suggest you do it if uh, you weren't lazy? Uh, I'd create another profile and add it to that, and okay. then add that profile to a machine. And, Excellent. Uh, okay. Thank you. But since I don't actually have any machines right now, I figured I'd go through and show the uh, just the full cycle with the global profile. So now that I have my profile updated, or I have my profile with my uh, default with the default password that I want in hash form, and uh, with my SSH keys, I will go ahead and uh, spin up a few machines. Should be able to see those machines starting to fixie boot. Yep, we see them. It's very exciting. We'll, off, we'll take a look at the workflow. They're going to start off booting into the discover stage. And then you'll see that they will pretty much instantaneously flicker over to installing CentOS 7.3. Um, right now, we don't have support for setting the root password in uh, Sledgehammer. That's a uh, thing that I plan on adding here pretty shortly. All right, and they have, they are all rebooting into the CentOS 7.3 install environment now. You can see that uh, for all three machines, they are currently in the CentOS 7.3 install stage and in the CentOS 7.3 install environment. So they're going to run through their shiny little installation. Once they are finished, they will boot into, they will boot off of the local hard drive. As you can see from the workflow map, once we've uh, finished uh, Doing our CentOS 7.3 install, we will uh, set up the SSH keys. And uh, once that is done, the OS install procedure will reboot. Um, you might notice that uh, this SSH access stage is going to happen while we are still in the CentOS 7.3 boot uh, environment. Um, that is our generic way of doing uh, post install uh, tasks so that uh, we can run post install tasks during an OS installation the same way we run uh, tasks in any other environment. Um, so once those, once those SSH keys are put into place, we will um, go to complete no wait, which will exit the runner and that'll let the OS uh, reboot and it will from there reboot into onto its local hard drive. So it should also be noted, uh, I think that the uh, stage maps and stages and tasks are all part of the uh, free but registered content. So the community, uh, pure community content without the rack end, free content uh, doesn't include stage maps and uh, uh, ta uh, tasks that are associated with the workflow elements. That's correct. Can I ask a question? Shoot. Uh, the stage map there, um, is that in order? No, that isn't in order. Um, that'd be a good optimization to have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <it's laughs> yeah. That is so like, like the to is to <laughs> number one, CentOS installed to SSH access as a post uh, install thing, and then uh, 
SSH access to complete no wait, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's and, correct. Yeah, that, that's correct. For that, you just kind of have to follow the arrows and figure out which uh, which stage doesn't have an arrow pointing. Yeah, got it. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, it was just confused. I thought they were, you had to set them up in order, like when you put them in there? Um, you don't. No. So you can set them up in any order, but we don't have, uh, we, we haven't implemented any code to draw them in order, essentially. The, the dilemma is that you can create loops, and we don't prevent loops, and so, um, which also makes it hard to figure out where the starting point is. Um, mm -hmm. So it's on my, it's on the list. <laughs> yeah, that's um, cool. This is great. Cool. The other, the graphs the other are the part of this. The, the other side effect of the stage maps here is it's kind of all the workflows that you would want all in one view. So if you were doing a complex system of like doing a discovery workflow and then an install workflow and then a decommission workflow, all those would show up together. And so part of another aspect of this view is showing that you have this, this stage set, this stage set, this stage set, right? And it's, it's oh, it's great. It's like life cycle things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Uh, good question. Good catch, Will. Appreciate it. And uh, we do have that on the roadmap to get the uh, UI sorted out and some of the stage map cycle stuff uh, fixed. And in fact, I don't think we have that on our uh, enhancement lists for 3.2. We'll have to see about adding that and see where it falls in the, the cards. So. Yeah. And, and, and UX, UX features are independent of the digital rebar release, release for that. So if things show up uh, as fast as we can get them in and they're tested. And, and usually I've actually, I've actually noticed that. <laughs> yeah. All right. And so we finished our boot. And so now let's go ahead and log in with our shiny, awesome password, which is coincidentally the same as the old password. For you too lazy to generate another hash, Victor? Uh, no, I generated another hash. I just wanted a hash that I could remember the password to, so I didn't look cool enough at all of a demo. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, so there's logging in, and uh, all right, he is this thing. You can just cat the uh, authorized keys file should be sufficient to show it's injected there. Yeah, well, all right. There's my SSH key. And it even hopefully notes that it is generated content and do not edit. So. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. Much appreciated. And I'm sure some, several of our community members will uh, enjoy uh, reviewing those tips and being able to generate content a little bit more or uh, configuration elements a little bit more easily. Um, any questions about all of that from the community? Yeah, so I had a, uh, a question um, that I posed to Greg the other day. And so profiles used to be, in my mind, just bags of parameters. And um, like I was calling, I was mapping two separate profiles to a single host. One does certain things and one does other things. And it seems now that profiles are, are things you use in stage maps. Like what type of, of thing um, you want to do to this server is that um, fair profiles are still just bags of uh parameters but um, you use them in stage maps right victor no uh stage map uh, a stage map is just another parameter wow it's, you're blowing my mind man profile. And <laughs> remember circular map. circular well now i see the circular <laughs> reference thing okay yeah uh yeah, yeah. Explain the, that further, if you would <laughs> I mean, the Sorry. stage map seems to be keying on like, uh, let me let me think about this here. Still sharing. Uh, yeah, I'm still sharing. I haven't. Like, where is so SSH right? access is a profile, right? No. no. It so is. the stage map is a definition of stages and the stages that you want to go through. Yeah. And if you can see my screen, I'm showing you this is the SSH, this is the SSH access stage. Okay, and, got it. Uh, you. Pretty much all it's responsible for doing is running the SSH access task and then changing to whatever the next stage is going to be. 
So it's like do this and hand off to them, right? Yes, that's exactly that. What you just described is that stage's function. Okay, why was I, why was I, I was doing the thing with packet and it seemed like you started with a profile. You mapped huh. the packet yeah. file to, that kicked off. So, so that, that made me think, oh, profiles are now like a class yeah. of, like you put machines, you map profiles to machines and that kind of like kicks off like how the stages happen. Well, so I got so that packet, point. well you, you don't have it completely wrong in the sense that profiles do kind of represent classes of machines at times. In the case of our packet content, what that's doing is it's using a stage called packet discover to figure out if the node is, or the machine is in packet. And if it is, the, the task that's run inside of the packet discover stage adds the packet, I think it's packet profile to the node, which then has the consequence of making a, a, a kernel console parameter available, setting a um, packet UID onto the node, which then allows the rest of the system to do things like making sure that the console is um, available. Like the SOS thing, right? Yeah. Right. That right. So that that way the TTY one will be used as the console right. instead of TTY zero, and it also will enable the packet IPMI um, content to drive it that way. So the point is, there's the packet one is kind of interesting because, and maybe we should talk about that in a future thing, because it kind of uses all the components of the system to drive a very specific set of behaviors, right? Okay, but it but it's not it can be used as a class of machine, but not necessarily so. It's really just a bag of parameters. Yes, exactly. A profile is just that. Okay, cool. Okay, so good question, Will and uh, uh, Greg and Victor. Thank you for the the follow up. That's important because there are key elements to driving digital rebar provision. Um, with that said, we are at 11.38 right now. We have got 22 minutes left. Um, I have a 15-minute content demo, but we can push that off to uh, next week uh, if we want to go to a little bit of planning, or do we want to go ahead and see that content demo now? Um, I, can pre I can record that content demo and post it to the meetup list as a separate element if we want to move forward with 3.2 planning and also talk a little bit about uh, uh, whether we want to add in a additional uh, weekly 30-minute uh, uh, demos uh, meetup online and move from two weeks to weekly. Any uh, thoughts on that? I think if content's like literally a show and tell and not interactive, it could be videoed, right? It, it's designed to be videoed, absolutely. And it's a show and tell of how the community content can is used. How do you completely plumb a DRP endpoint from install to uh, ready to deploy uh, nodes and machines rather, so. Why don't we? I would vote for planning. Um, That's just my opinion. Say that again, Will. I, I would vote for planning. Planning. All right. Sounds good. Uh, community has spoken. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I am not. The community. I'm not the community. Uh, all right. So I'll go ahead and record the content video and get that pushed out a little later this afternoon for those that are interested in seeing it. Uh, I'll post the links uh, both for this meetup and the demo links. Uh, for the community content to the meetup channel for those interested. Uh, in the meantime, let's uh, move forward. Uh, m most of you know uh, we just completed our DRP and uh, provisioning version 3.1, which was a fairly major release uh, from 3.0 to 3.1. A lot of really good features in it. We talked about it uh, two weeks ago in the meetup. Uh, this week, we want to start talking a little bit about uh, future planning for enhancements and uh, new features to go into 3.2. And we voted last week to use the GitHub 
uh, uh, projects solution. So let me go ahead and um, I can't start screen sharing, uh, Victor, until you release. Sorry, I just had to shift. I just had to do a real quick micro demo while you were talking. So as soon, there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, if I can figure out which of these bad boy. Here we go. Uh, so, uh, oh right. We're not doing a demo right now, are we guys? Stop screen share. Let's share the correct screen. And we are going to There we go. So DOP version two. Um, does everybody see my screen? It went away from me. Yes. All right, excellent. So DRP uh, version 3.2, uh, we made, well, we, I made a very quick pass at starting out the project uh, Kanban-like uh, uh, planning uh, for 3.2. So some of the features that we had, uh, we pushed into the queue uh, that we want to look at whether we want to move them into the to-do uh, for the 3.2 project. Those that don't go into 3.2 will probably be deferred to a follow-up re uh, release, either 3.3 or uh, depending on how our release planning goes forward from there. Um, but with the, the the major features that we've request that we've had requested and, and look at adding are uh, the following in the list in the request column. So embedded assets, uh, currently there's an issue with the embedded assets that uh, causes uh, an existing, let's see, how does this, uh, wow. You re them every time you launch, so. Pardon? Oh yeah, we just re-expand all of our embedded assets every time you launch DR provision, so that's hard to overwrite them. Exactly. So the specific issue is, for example, when you upload a new ISO, the ISO ex is exploded into the TFTP boot directory structure. That script that's responsible for that, if there are any issues in it, not saying that there necessarily are, but if there were issues in it, um, every time you restart or hop the DR provision server, it extracts, extracts the explode iso.shell over the top of the existing one, which sort of makes it sort of immutable explosions, as I call it. Uh, that's great, except that if you have an issue and you need to change the behavior of that script, you can't do that. So we have this feature request on the list, uh, which is a relatively small feature, I believe. Uh, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I believe it's relatively small. Some of these uh, uh, enhancements don't have a whole lot of content in them. We haven't yeah. fleshed them out yet. Um, yeah, so default stage transition is basically, we've noticed that the trend is for every single stage to include at the end of itself, the uh, change stage um, task. And, and there's a couple of uh, technical issues with doing it that way in that you can leave dangling jobs open and a few other things. And so we think the best way to fix that is to just have um, the stages by default, check that map whenever they run out of tasks to run and then transition as appropriate. Um, you'll get some more control out of the stage itself. Um, the reboot flag, for example, on the stage will become meaningful. Uh, <laughs> And um, the, the map will still exist, but you won't have to worry about adding a change stage. Additionally, we'll probably create a no-op stage called none and a few other things to make uh, life a little easier for manipulating and living in the stage world. Um, how's that going to interact with the uh, dash wait stages that just want to sit there and chill and wait for additional tasks to get pushed right, out of the so, we'll have to pay attention to that flag. And so the, the wait for task flag will cause the system to not go through that last change stage until the, until the stage. You might want to have some sort of pseudo task that says, 
be done. Yeah. Be done or stop or whatever. Yeah. So we're finalizing what that means, but that's that's what's coming for that one. So, okay. Uh, in addition to changes to stage transitions, um, there was a request for uh, modifying the create behavior. The current create behavior requires a JSON blob to be passed in. Uh, it'd be nice if we could be able to pass in a file directly from file system or possibly a URL reference to a file. Uh, on some existing HTTP uh, repo somewhere, or possibly even uh, a GitHub or a Git checkout uh, of some sort. So uh, this is a small uh, change to basically the create stage of command line and how content would be pushed in. Uh, we have also uh, some updates to the plugin model. Uh, again, I uh, got kind of a placeholder here, so we need a little bit better description on exactly what we're looking to do with the plugin model and how and what we're looking to update. I believe, uh, again, that's you, Greg. Yeah, so as part of the uh, Terraform provider work that we did to create, um, it was pointed out that uh, HashiCorp has a plugin set of Go libraries that look very much like the library that I and Victor had started writing to do plugins. So um, their library is much further along and better uh, vetted and tested and it matches what we were doing. And so the goal is to change over to that. We get better logging and support and some other stuff. Um, and so the goal is to kind of transition over to that before we fully publish the how do I build a plugin documentation so that we're all using this with one pass. It'll be generally cleaner and simpler. So um, that will be that will be a true three two item. Um, same with the stage change. Some of the others um, depending on when we do them relative to some other things may fall into a 311, but we can talk about 311 here in a second. And so is that their general uh, Go plugin library? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So HashiCorp has, um, the, all of their tools have plugin capabilities in effect, and they wrote a very rich library for driving that. And so it, it's basically like the, system says RPC over um, basically standard in and standard out. Okay. Um, and so it allows you to exact things. It turns out it's exactly what I wrote for our plugin model. Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely getting into the, um, we don't want to support that. They use this, they tested a lot. It's used in like three or four of their products already. So, um, it's vetted and it doesn't change very much anymore. Okay. So it's much cleaner in that okay. regard. So that's where we're headed. Um, the big feature that we'll eventually take advantage of is that right now the our plugin model is um, unidirectional. You kind of push into the plugin, um, but it's kind of hard for the plugin to push back into DRP their plugin model is much more bi-directional, which is useful if we ever want to do things like extending APIs or um, generating direct API calls and other stuff. Okay, excellent, sounds good. Um, and then uh, following that, we had clean up exploded ISO. So currently uh, as content is revisioned, uh, in this case specifically boot M's, we see that the sledgehammer uh, uh, boot M gets updated on occasion. And when that happens, we have old uh, boot M's sitting around and it's not particularly easy to remove all of them through uh, API or CLI calls. So you have to go into file system and manually remove elements that you don't need anymore. So it'd be nice to see some enhancements around cleaning up of exploded ISOs. Um, obviously some sanity checks about what ISOs or boot M's are actually in use uh, should probably be 
um, provided around that. So that's one of the features. Uh, and then I believe the last one, which is also a relatively big one and interesting one that uh, we've seen a lot of requests for is machine inventory and classification. So the old uh, digital rebar provision or digital rebar version two rather platform had the ability to do some uh, classification and there are some interesting things that can be done around classification. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about that also, Greg? Um, well, I'll start by saying my guess is we'll probably split this into two features. Yeah, this is going to be a two feature thing. One is inventory and then the other is classification. And we'll start with inventory first. And Victor's been working on that, so why don't I let him talk about it? Okay, so let me yeah. go ahead and just modify this enhancement request to inventory only. And we'll add a second one for classification. Yeah, that would be awesome. Okay, uh, go ahead, Victor. Let's talk about inventory then. Okay, so for digital rebar version two, its inventory system leaned pretty heavily on OHI. OHI, if you're not uh, familiar with it, is the uh, inventory system that uh, Opscode, and I refuse to call him uh, Chef, initially wrote for, uh, initially wrote for Chef. Um, it's got a nice plug-in model. It's highly extensible. The downside is that it's uh, written in Ruby and uh, it's hard to find prepackaged versions of it that don't also pull in all of Chef, which we really don't want to carry that stuff around and sledgehammer any longer than we absolutely have to. Um, also, it includes a lot more data than we actually care about right now. So what I've been working on is kind of a uh, work-alike that is written in Go called Go High. And uh, that is uh, embedded on the latest uh, version of Sledgehammer that we have. And it's a little uh, two and a half meg Go binary that uh, knows how to uh, read out uh, DMI information. I've uh, picked a useful selection of uh, DMI information for doing basic machine classification. Um, it knows how to inventory the network system, um, and it also knows how to grab basic system information. I've got a couple of other things on the list. Um, right now, uh, development of that is in a uh, closed uh, repository on GitHub. Um, if anyone's interested in seeing uh, where that's going and uh, giving me feedback as to uh, what sort of things we should uh, add plugins for, um, you know, yeah. we, we can add y'all as collab. You know, we can add people as collaborators for it until we decide that it's time to uh, open the repository up. But right now, it's still kind of in flux. So. And if I recall, if I recall correctly, there were some uh, missing elements to OHI. Uh, and that was what disks, uh, disk uh, partitioning information was not available in OHI, but is a feature that's also going to be added in the Go, OHI, Go High. Uh, the thing about OHI is it behaves much more properly when it's run directly from Chef Client. Um, if you run it outside of Chef Client, it uh, screws some things up. Yeah. Okay. And you're right. So we're talking about adding things like disks um, are still in flight. And what that means, partitioning information, like you said. And then um, we know the, the community wills ask for GPUs which is a perfectly reasonable request. Um, and we'll probably have some initial form. GPUs are a little tricky because they're kind of finicky, uh, whimsical things that don't always show up correctly, but um, we'll, find, we'll figure something out. Um, and so the point is the, the inventory system is gathering this and um, the plan is to provide a parameter that has kind of the whole thing as a JSON block. And then we'll provide helper parameters that are pre-parsed sections of that into specific parameters so that you can do more direct filtering. And the idea is that the API and the UI, well, API already has and the UI has coming, a set of things around being able to filter machines, select machines by parameter types and stuff like that. So um, that's the kind of scope of the inventory component. Um, yeah. So 
delivery of this will be through um, Go High being embedded in Sledgehammer, and then potentially, not potentially, there will be a content layer that has a uh, set of tasks and an example stage for running inventory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I believe okay. that wraps up. Um, boy, my uh, there we go. My internet connection is really bad. <laughs> my internet the connection is really bad yeah. there. So I'm already working on that. So go ahead and drag that one over. Or I'm already working on the machine inventory. So go ahead and drag that over to two. <laughs> All right. So we'll go drag that over. Um, uh, where do we feel the rest of these uh, features are at? Do we have any uh, feedback from community on uh, specific interests in these? Uh, we do want to keep it short, though, because we're running under about five minutes left here. You said you guys were working on stage transitions now, yeah? Uh, cleaning up the yeah, stage still, transitions. Yeah, still working on defining it. It will most likely be in 3.2. It'll probably, probably. Be, uh, okay. be a defining content for it. Okay, so Greg has just anointed stage oh, transition okay. cleanup into 3.2. Uh, what about uh, plug-in model? I'd love to do that, but I don't know if I want to guarantee it yet. Okay. Also, that's, yeah, the, uh, the plug-in model for now, um, we don't actually have documentation on how other people use it, so it's more of an internal engineering thing than anything else. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's leave this in the request column for now, um, depending on where... Um, the 3132 um, release cycle sits, we may add it or not, uh, depending on. And we, we need to have a discussion uh, about how long the 32 release is. Yeah. Um, likely, right, I think we, I don't know, we have to, that yeah. might be the a key topic for next, next meeting. Well, and I was going to add, um, I am going, this, this is Greg again, for those who don't know. Um, I am seriously considering pushing a 311 here in the next couple of days once we validate a bug fix around um, stage object validation. We've been getting some issues around the fact that um, stages don't get their um, validity changed when the dependent components become valid. And that's actually pretty annoying and bad. You're here. Okay. So, so the thought is we may cut a 311 with that in it. So, I, I, and I don't think these will be in that, but just realize they'll probably be something in the next couple of days. No, new features should not be in 311. The, those 311 should only be bug fixes to 31, and any of those bugs should be ported forward to 32 if we have a 32 um, uh, tree in place already. So. Um, let's focus uh, just on 3.2. It's good to hear. We, we definitely want to get the bug fixes out, but let's focus on the 3.2 um, features and enhancements versus bug fixes. Uh, so uh, from, from the, the enable local FS content, that's actually pretty simple. Um, if you want to learn a bit of Go, Shane, you know, it would be, <laughs> be a good learning thing. But, it's, it's actually pretty easy to do that. So, so that's, that one's not too bad. Um, and that one we should put in. That's an easy and helpful change. Okay. Um, so let's, we're going to try and include that in there as well. The embedded assets, again, is another fairly straightforward one. Um, and not too bad. Um, update plugin model. We still need to do some research. So I would not necessarily force it in the 3.2 at the current moment. And then the cleanup. That one's actually... So cleanup of exploded ISOs, probably leave that in request column for the moment. If there's enough room and depending on release cycle, we can see about slipping that in there. I don't think it's going to be a whole lot of work. Uh, it's annoying, but it's not fatal. It's a, little, um, it's a little tricky and that the only thing that knows where an exploded ISO lives right now is exploded ISO.sh. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the little... That, that is the annoying side effect of how we've implemented that subsystem. Yeah. Okay. That, that particular subsystem is also very, very old. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's like, that's like crowbar old. 
Okay. Well, so with that, we're going to start wrapping up because we're starting to run up against the clock here. Um, so to this week, we talked about uh, Kubernetes deployment, password and, and keys. We didn't get to the loading content demo. I will record a loading content demo and publish that uh, this afternoon to YouTube. I'll also post it on the meetup Dot com. The very last agenda item that we'd like to talk about, and I have not looked at, we do not have a whole lot of votes. So it doesn't seem like anybody in the community is at the moment particularly having a burning feeling one way or the other whether we should uh, move from uh, every other weekly to a weekly meetup. Uh, the proposal was to do our full uh, one hour show, which includes both some demo and um, community uh, release and um, project planning stuff on uh, one hour sh every other week and then add a additional 30 minute show to do some additional demo and maybe some light uh, planning if and necessary to follow up from previous weeks uh, meetup. Do we have any feeling from anyone on uh, on board with us today um, whether we would like to do that or is the two week cadence still mm -hmm. sufficient? I voted for every other week. So there's, there's the one vote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I think it, you guys release videos like the how to things when you get time and release them, you know? So I, I guess it would, it, the use case would be to like have Q and A after you review it, right? Okay, so that's, so that's good feedback. Uh, anyone else, Rob, do you have any feelings on how you'd like to drive that or see that? I, I'm, I'm flexible. If you know, it, we we don't. If it's just racking people coming to a meeting, we don't need to have. You know, we don't want to drive a ton of meetings that are like that. At the same time, I could see opportunities to talk about the UX and do some more deep dives on a, on a biweekly on the on the opposite week cadences and things like that. So we're open to it if you know if we're going to have good discussions. Okay, so let's let's leave it at the two-week cadence for now. Uh, we'll leave the poll open, and if there's a strong community interest to uh, increase the cadence of that, we can do that in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so with that being said, let's wrap up uh, version two. Uh, we'll post uh, uh, version three uh, details shortly, and that'll be coming soon, and look forward to that in the Meetup uh, channel. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it, and talk to you all later. Thanks, Shane. All right. Thank you, Shane. Thanks. This speaker really works much better than I would have expected. <laughs>